Okay, so now we're going to switch to an, an entirely different uh, philosophical approach in approximation where we approximate policies as opposed to approximating cost functions. So we're going to talk about that and then we're going to return uh, to, um, to cost function approximation but using a different approach. We just approximate, we just replace the tail problem with an approximation and we solve that. Okay. So let's go into approximation in policy space. We introduce a parametric approximation architecture not for cost functions but for policies. So a policy consists of n, n uh, uh, control functions, functions of the state, but also they are parameterized sort of parameters, R0 up to Rn minus 1. Then we do some training offline to obtain these parameters which involves some kind of optimization, perhaps some kind of regression, perhaps something different. Now, a great advantage of this approach, after we do the training offline and we have an architecture, then the online calculation of the controls is very fast. We don't have to do any expectations, any minimizations online. It's all very simple. So that's the big advantage of approximation in policy space. Um, Generally speaking, an important use of approximation in policy space is if we have already some policy and then we fit an approximation architecture to it in order to simplify the online calculation of controls. So that we train offline a cost function approximation and we compute many state control pairs by, um, by using uh, some form of uh, using the standard way, one step look ahead or multi step look ahead. So once we have these pairs, then we can train a policy architecture by some form of regression. We fit the architecture into the controls that correspond to the state. Okay, there's also a regularization term. This is a least squares problem, typically non linear. Okay. Uh, because of the, because, because it's difficult to, very often to, to obtain good features for the policies. And um, as I said, this idea applies more generally. If you have any kind of software or human expert and you can generate a training set of good state control pairs, then you can train in policy space using an architecture. Now this idea has been applied uh, one way to apply this idea is to, is to observe that um, a policy parametrization using a vector r parametrizes also cost functions as, a function, as, as uh, functions of the initial state and that for a given initial state this depends on the parameter vector and uh, you may want to directly optimize over the parameters this cost function. So for a given R, you can calculate the cost for any initial state. You can, contain, you can calculate an optimal cost over that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, an average cost for a number of uh, initial states. And then you have a cost function that depends on just R. Now it's a very complicated function. You may attempt to do something like gradient-based optimization. Uh, this can be difficult in many settings. Another possibility that people have tried is random search, like genetic algorithms, various in the space of parameters. And a method that has, with, that has been quite successful in a number of contexts in dynamic programming is a method called cross-entropy. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's uh, one of the more uh, interesting recent uh, uh, random search methods. People have used it, and I'll give you an example a little later. Okay, now here's another important special case. Suppose that, um, how do you parameterize a policy? Sometimes the parameterization sort of suggests itself because of the character of the problem. In other cases, you can obtain a policy parameterization through cost parameterization. Once you have a cost function parameterization, this induces a policy parameterization and you can try to optimize directly the RKs viewed as parameters of the policy. And um, 
Let me give you an example, the game of Tetris, with which I had some involvement um, in the past. Um, I'm sure that many of you know the game of Tetris. It involves uh, a rectangular wall of uh, blocks, uh, which uh, start, you start out with an empty uh, wall, and then uh, objects fall from the top. They have different shapes, and you have to move them and rotate them, and then let them fall until they hit some other blocks. And uh, in this way, you may be able to complete completely uh, some rows, in which case these are eliminated, you score points, and so on. So the objective is not to let the wall build up to reach the top, because then you lose the game and that's the end. And your total score is the number of rows that you have been, been able to eliminate in between. So you can view this game as a stochastic optimal control uh, where, uh, uh, problem, where, uh, the, where the the, the states are all the possible configurations of the wall. Uh, and uh, the number of states is extraordinary here, because if for a standard uh, bo board of 10 by 20, uh, the number of states goes immediately 2 to the 200. That's more than the number of uh, molecules in the entire universe. And it's just very big. Uh, however, uh, I think starting at MIT back in the 90s, uh, we have been trying to address this, uh, uh, this, um, this problem with feature-based architectures. And um, in the early 90s, there was uh, Ben Van Roy there. Ben Van Roy is a prominent researcher in the field of uh, approximate dynamic programming. He was a student, then a master's student. He did his master's thesis with John Cicicles, using a feature-based architecture to train uh, the Tetris a Tetris, Tetris player um, that involved three features. Okay, so from a, a two to the two hundred dimensional problem, he reduced into a three dimensional problem because there are only three ways to calculate for the for for, for these features, and uh, and. Uh, People were quite impressed that this could even play. It learned how to play, and it could score an average of 32 lines per game. Uh, then I had a student uh, took one of my classes, and, uh, and he suggested using an architecture involving 22 features. Now, these features were, these were features of the position. In this particular case, the 22 features were 10 features that was, were the heights of the, of, the, of, of, the, of, of the columns of the wall. Another nine features which gave the differences between heights of adjacent columns. And there was another feature that was the, the maximum height of the wall, uh, the, um, the number of holes in the wall, and so on. And we used a special method that that had some theoretical advantage of the standard it was a new method. And we trained a Tetris architecture through self-play and using a method called uh, policy, the approximate policy iteration. And from a score of 32, we're able to get to thousands, a score of, th of thousands, like 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 in that range. And, that, and we thought that we did great. Um, then some other people came along and they used different methods for training, but the same 22 feature architecture, they were able to raise the score somewhat to 5,000 and, uh, and uh, then they were claiming that, well, we have a better method, that's why we were able to get a, a higher score. Um, and that's where things laid, but we never knew how close to optimum we were. We just knew that we were doing better than others or worse but we didn't know how, how, how good we were doing. And this state of affairs uh, kept for a number of years, and then some group used the same 22 feature architecture, but they used optimization in approximation in policy space, involving a random search method, which was in fact a version of this, of this, um, this cross-entropy method. And they raised the score from 4,000, 5,000, and so on 
to close to a million, okay, per game, an average of a million per game. The, there was, there were good approximations, good weight values that we did not suspect that were doing spectacularly better than the ones that we were calculating. And they did this, we were using approximation in value space, they were using approximation in policy space and random search. Um, so that was uh, quite a surprise and it's also indicative of a generic problem that we have in this field. You may be doing, you may have a solution that seems to work reasonably well, but you can't really tell how close you are to the optimum. The quality of the approximation may not be easy to, to, to tell. And it took here years before we could discover that they were actually much better, um, much better players than the ones that we were constructing. So there's a long history of successes and failures, and uh, the, the Tetris uh, testbed is used often in competitions, and in fact, there is another group in France that recently uh, used methods that were close to the ones that we were, we were, we were using originally in the mid-90s, uh, but they did it in some somewhat different way, and they were able, in fact, to surpass the success of the random search approximation in policy space people. So, there's... Uh, there are a lot of uh, twists and turns in implementations of uh, challenge problems in this field and, um, and uh, evaluating how well you're doing is one of our major problems. Okay, now let me go into a, a last subject. We go back to approximation in value space and uh, let's, uh, we have look ahead minimization and we have cost to go approximation and if we were to do exact dynamic programming, this would be the optimal cost function of the tail problem, starting from this state. However, what we do here is we take this problem and we simplify it. Simplify it to the point where we can solve it exactly by dynamic programming and use the solution of the simplification as, in play, as J tilde in place of the optimal cost to go. Okay. So how do we simplify problems? Well, there are many ways to do that. If they involve a couple subsystems, you, de you artificially decompose the subsystems. If they involve complicated nonlinearities, perhaps you replace them by linear uh, approximations. If there are, um, uh, if there are uh, difficult, um, difficult probability distributions, you may simplify them or replace the stochastics with deterministic quantities. All of this stuff is part of this type of methodology and is used quite frequently and often with success. So, we obtain here the, uh, the cost to go approximation as the cost to go of a simplified problem which we solve exactly or approximately and um, okay, one possibility is when you have interconnected subsystems, uh, problems involving a collection of uh, subsystems interacting with each other and each subsystem having its own control. Okay, so they can choose controls individually, but they have to be coordinated so that uh, they do the right thing together. Well, one possibility for approximation is to just artificially split the interconnected systems and optimize one at a time by keeping the values and the controls of the other subsystems at nominal, at nominal values. Another possibility, if you have, uh, if the subsystems are coupled through constraints, let's say resource constraints, uh, relax the constraint, decouple the systems this way and uh, solve the corresponding problem more easily. Uh, there are methods of Lagrangian relaxation that I'm not going to go into here. Um, now, there's a generic class of methods based on probabilistic approximation, replace random variables with deterministic quantities and solve the corresponding problem. And there's another class of methods based on aggregation where you take a system with many, many states and you combine states together, so to speak, to create a smaller dimensional system that perhaps you can handle by dynamic programming. Okay, I'm going to say a few things about all these possibilities. I'm going to rush this, but I want to give you the general idea. Um, let's uh, take a, a system that consists of subsystems which are coupled in some way uh, UK1 is the control of the 
first subsystem, JK2 and so on, UKN, their N subsystems, UKI is the control corresponding to the I subsystem, and they are dynamic systems. This is the control at time K, and there are controls from time zero up to time N. So they are N subsystems, and they run from time zero to time N, and we want to compute a cost to go approximation. We may just freeze at a given state, freeze the controls of all subsystems except one. And then we have an optimization problem involving a single subsystem, which often is easier to solve. We solve that and we calculate a, a cost function associated with it. Um, and then we repeat for all subsystems in turn, go to the next state, do them one at a time, and, uh, and so on. And, and uh, this type of problem often works well. Here's an example where it makes sense intuitively. You have um, a road network and vehicles at different locations, and there are various tasks that need to be performed. They can be performed by any vehicle. And, um, they have to coordinate, however, so that they don't go to the same place. They have to split the task between them. And, uh, and there are all kinds of costs associated here. There's value for doing the tasks, and there are costs for getting to the locations. And uh, such problems are called multi-vehicle routing problems. And in combinatorial optimization, they are among the most difficult. They are really complicated problems. However, it may very often, the problem involving a single vehicle is relatively simple. It involves designing a route to go from the current place to some other place over time. And uh, makes sense to optimize here one vehicle at a time. Design the route for one vehicle, keeping the routes of the other vehicles at some nominal values. Then freeze that route and then go to the second vehicle, and so on. That's an example of what I mean by uh, enforced decomposition, one at a time. OK, so let's uh, go to another example. Suppose that we have subsystems that are completely decoupled, except the control constraint. Now suppose that there is a con we have two subsystems here, and there's a control constraint for UK1 and UK2. Their sum has to be constant. This is a typical resource constraint that you might have. And uh, here we have states that consist of the, the local states of the subsystems, controls that cons and so on, disturbances. And, uh, and let's assume that the only coupling comes through a control like this. Then what we can do, replace this simplex constraint with a box constraint, a larger constraint. And with this constraint, the subsystems are decoupled because the only coupling has been eliminated and uh, you can solve the problem one subsystem at a time and you obtain a cost function j tilde for each subsystem and then the overall cost to go approximation is the sum of those. And you do this for every stage and um, this, me this, th this method uh, was very popular in uh, in uh, in, in flexible manufacturing systems, uh, which uh, uh, were, were, very, were very important applications and they were, they, saw, they were the object of considerable research in the, uh, within the last 20 years. And you have a, you have a machine shop with various, um, with, uh, various machines. They, uh, they uh, share uh, resources and, you, um, and uh, you do the allocation of tasks to machines according to approximate dynamic programming where J tilde is calculated one subsystem at a time. Okay, I'm not going to go into these details because we are running short of time. I want to cover more, some other things. Probabilistic approximations, a different kind of approximation where uh, if the problem is complicated by the presence of various probability distributions, in order to calculate the calculation, to, to simplify the calculation of the approximate cost to go, uh, we replace the probability distributions and the random variables with deterministic quantities. This is called certainty equivalent control. 
and is inspired by linear quadratic control problems, where in fact the substitution of, of, of uncertain quantities by expected values is, um, uh, is, uh, preserves optimality. Um, then what we have is uh, tail problems that are deterministic, so they can be solved by deterministic methods. Sometimes the deterministic methods can be very, very efficient, and that simplifies the problem. Um, besides the W case, it's possible to introduce, in cases where there, is, there are forecast uncertainties um, in the problem, we can use expected values, use the expected value of the forecast in order to make the calculations and then update the policy when the forecast change. Um, can do online replanning um, after, as we go along. And there are some variants here. There's a method called partial certain equivalence, which we fix some of the uncertain quantities to nominal deterministic values, and others we keep them stochastic. If this does not complicate the solution of the approximate problem, that's fine. Uh, limited simulation in place of fixing to a single deterministic value may be another possibility. There are all sorts of options, problem dependent. Okay, the last method I'm going to discuss is uh, aggregation. Uh, you have a system that involves many, many states, many, many calculations, and you create aggregate states that sort of, com well, one example is, uh, is um, they combine many states together. Um, another example may be, um, may be that the aggregate states uh, may correspond to a discretization of the original problem. There are many different ways to define the, these aggregate states. And um, uh, we create an aggregate problem involving these fewer states. We solve that exactly, and we use the approx the 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 exact cost to go for the of the aggregate problem as approximate cost to go for the original. Okay, some uh, aggregation examples when you have a, a, a problem involving a continuous state space and then you consider as aggregate states various discretization points and then you associate neighboring states to the uh, to points in the discretization grid. Um, there are many different possibilities, and an interesting possibility is discretization based on features. You create a certain a feature vector for the state, and you discretize the, um, the in feature space so that states that have similar features are together. Okay, so now, um, what is the formal mathematical framework here? Once you choose these aggregate states, and they can be very general, uh, you can, uh, in the method of choice, can, there are many different ways to choose them. You can associate them with the original system states uh, by encoding a certain relation that depends on probabilities. The each each, each um, aggregate state is connected through some probability distribution with uh, some original system states, and each original system state is connected with uh, some other probability distribution to the aggregate states, which indicate the degree of membership of this state into the aggregate state. The upshot is that you have a composite system involving both the aggregate states and the original states that are connected through this disaggregation and aggregation probabilities. And, um, and uh, uh, this probabilities together with the transition probabilities of the original system define an aggregate system and an aggregate problem. And uh, you can write down the dynamic programming algorithm for that. You can find the optimal cost to go of the aggregate problem and then you approximate the cost to go of the, of the original problem by using these aggregation probabilities to weigh the, um, the the optimal cost of the aggregate, um, uh, the aggregate system. So it turns out that this can be viewed also as an approximation architecture, a linear approximation architecture with the weights, with the features being this aggregation, aggregation probabilities. It's interesting theory in aggregation and particularly for infinite horizon.
And uh, it's, a, it's a big topic that I'm only just summarizing very broadly. OK, so now let me go into my last slide. Uh, what we have covered, we focused on approximate dynamic programming for finite horizon problems and with perfect state information. We talked about approximation in value space, about approximation in policy space, perhaps in combination with approximation in value space where we build a policy space approximator based on the cost approximation that we may have in some other way. Now, all these different techniques and the, all these different ideas involved in approximation value space, it's not one technique that works better than all the others. It's usually the proper mix of techniques combined together that can be brought to bear on a difficult problem. There is a rich theory of approximate dynamic programming for infinite horizon problems. In fact, most of the theory is for infinite horizon problems. But um, we uh, have not gone into that. Uh, ideas and Rollins apply to infinite horizon problems uh, as well. It's just that rollout cannot go to the end of the horizon because the horizon is infinite. So you have to use a limited horizon with cost approximation at the end. Um, there are special training methods for approximation in value space, like this temporal difference methods that were mentioned earlier, TD Lambda and others that, 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 that for a while were quite mysterious uh, in just what they were. Eventually people figured out that there are stochastic iterative methods that have very interesting, mathematically speaking, a very interesting theory and convergence analysis and so on. Uh, it turns out that TD lambda is also, in temporal difference methods is also connected with, the, with another famous algorithm from an entirely different field, from convex analysis, the proximal algorithm. I don't know how many of you are aware of the proximal algorithm. It's one of the major methods for deterministic convex optimization. It turns out that TD lambda is a proximal algorithm. And this is something that I'm doing, that's where my research is for the moment one of the things I'm working on. And I have a video lecture, if you're interested to see that. It makes the connection between approximate dynamic programming and convex optimization. We haven't talked about imperfect state information problems. As I noted at some point, they can be converted to perfect state information problems, but much more complex, where the state, um, the state in the transformed problem is the so-called belief state or probability distribution of the current state given the information that you have collected so far. So they are very, very difficult problems and therefore they are prime candidates for uh, approximations. And uh, there are people who work intensively in these areas because very often in practice you have imperfect state information. You cannot measure the exact value of the state. Uh, you have um, only some some noisy information or some other thing that things like that. Okay, so there are some other um, approximation value space methods that we haven't uh, talked about. Model predictive control is a major topic in control theory. It's it, it practic some people think that it's the 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 dominant method in control system design these days. It turns out that model predictive control is a rollout algorithm with the heuristic being some kind of limited horizon optimization to the origin for those of you who have an idea of what model predictive control is. So model predictive control and approximate dynamic programming are very closely connected. There's another old technique that dates to the 70s called open loop feedback control which is also can be viewed as approximation in value space. We haven't talked about that. Uh, the open loop feedback control is related to certainty equivalent control, but it has a more of a solid mathematical basis. And there are other techniques that uh, this is a very, very broad field, great variety of methods that come and go into popularity. Dynamic programming applies to all sorts of 
other problems other than stochastic optimal control. They apply to minimax problems, game problems, like for example, backgammon and chess and uh, go are not really stochastic optimal control problems, they are game problems and they involve two players. There is a dynamic programming algorithm for those, there is similar theory and there are approximations that people use. Um, there is um, so risk sensitive type of problems involving an exponential cost function and uh, all of these share some parts of the theory in the, both of the exact and the approximation solution methodology. Finally, what we desperately need in this field and we don't really have except to a very limited extent is an es a sense of how good our approximations are. We need error bounds and ways to do error bound analysis but the results here are, are very few, at least general results. Perhaps in some special context there might be some error bounds that apply but it is something that uh, where this entire field of approximate dynamic programming is lacking. We often don't know how well our designs perform and how far away they are from the optimum. Okay, so I hope you're interested in some of the things that we haven't covered and uh, I'll, be, I'll be around here until Thursday. You can uh, write to me or uh, also and uh, I'll be happy to discuss uh, any questions that you might have. So, uh, is there any work related to, uh, let's say, if the, if the state dimension or the control dimension change online? So, are the problems uh, I mean, we have new states uh, uh, arriving on new control capabilities? I mean, just for information, if there is uh, something related to that. Um, problems where uh, the state space may change online in ways that you could not predict uh, fully when you started, they can still be formulated in as much more complicated dynamic programming problems. But because they are so complicated, typically what people do is online replanning. In other words, once something, some data of the problem changes, they resolve the problem using the new data online. It has to be done online, and then they keep going. Now that typically works, but we don't really know how well it works and whether it's going to work in a particular case. So, so I, I guess that's true in this case that uh, when the new states arrive, we know the states. We have uh, certain knowledge about the, in order to solve the problem online then, again. Right, so that, that involves perfect state information. If, if, if you don't know this change or you have only partial information on it, then you have a problem of imperfect state information. So already it's been a difficult problem before, now it's far more difficult with imperfect state information. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Well, um, uh, I would like to just uh, in closing with this. Uh, Thank the Professor Bertzegas for, uh, um, first of all, for coming to the University of Cyprus and uh, to give us this uh, very interesting lecture. I, I think uh, all of us have learned something out of this and, uh, and I'm sure some of these ideas will be uh, uh, going to some of your, uh, some of your research work and, uh, and uh, it has been a great pleasure to, to host uh, Professor Bertsegas and, uh, and we hope that you will come back again. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>